Last year, I was focusing mainly on crypto agility. And I'm happy to hear and to observe that uh, the topic has spread out, uh, not just because I was talking about it, of course, but you see that crypto agility is a topic in major cybersecurity conferences. Uh, standardization bodies are discussing it, different security providers are discussing it, as you see just by Thomas. Crypto agility gets more important and more important to consider and to think about how you can move your system, your application to be more crypto agile. So last year I was focusing just slowly on crypto agility and today I would like to step, uh, uh, step one step further and look at the bigger picture. And I would like to introduce you to the concept of uh, cryptography lifecycle management. Because when you talk about crypto agility and swapping out crypto algorithms, uh, moving on to new standards, etc., it's basically managing the life cycle of your cryptographic implementation. And as we saw in the past with countless examples that uh, where you need to change your crypto to new cryptographic algorithms, either by uh, vulnerable imp implementations, bugs, uh, new standards announced, etc., you need additional mechanisms to get control of those things. And in cryptography, lifecycle mentioned there are basically two, two worlds come together. One is the threat management part, where you learn what issue you have, the crypto agility part, which gives you the tools to solve the issue. And I will show it in a use case in the post-quantum crypto, how all the things are coming together. Where post-quantum crypto is just one example, you can use any crypto issue and, and replicate that. Uh, post-quantum cryptography is just one of the main driver of crypto agility because in that case, you sort of have a 100% guarantee that things will break. Uh, in other cases, you never know. So, uh, although we, this is a PKI conference, PKI is a specific use case of cryptography, we know today, uh, we know that crypto is used in every security system. Uh, it's a critical building block for every security system, and the more we digitalize, the more devices we create and connect to a network, the more important and the more widespread gets cryptography. Uh, without cryptography, there is no security, so it's a fundamental building block of every security system, so it's really, really important. Um, in the past, in the past, let's say, two decades, the way cryptography was integrated was uh, so that it's deeply embedded, it's often hard-coded, the algorithms you're using are hard-coded, uh, you use a lot of uh, crypto hardware in certain use cases, and those things are fixed, not changeable. And uh, uh, as, as a cryptographer, you already know that uh, crypto is, is a moving, moving world. Uh, nothing stays uh, there forever. New standards are announced. A um, uh, new type of crypto uh, is invented. Uh, we need to get stronger keys because attackers are getting better. Uh, we get more computational power to mount attacks and so on. And there, we saw, especially in the last few years, more and more crypto issues popping up, right? Uh, Rocker was one of the most famous ones because it was really, uh, one of them had was surprising, but also one uh, a really big issue because it was better than smart card chips, the issue, and it was very widespread, and uh, the, the vulnerability was really huge since, you know, if you had a certificate using one of those keys, you basically could uh, derive uh, from the public key the private key. So that's really a terrible thing. And there, other threats coming up. And quantum threat, the quantum computer threat is getting more and more important, and we will also discuss this a little bit more. And there, on another side, are also new regulations coming up. Uh, we saw GDPR, the, uh, then DSS standards, and maybe there will be some IoT regulations around uh, crypto as well. They are uh, sometimes implicitly or explicitly saying something about cryptography, uh, something more explicit, uh, otherwise they're just saying, yo, you need to encrypt, uh, but how you do it, it's up to you. But we see that there are more requirements popping up to uh, accommodate uh, certain uh, security features. Um, so often I get a first feedback is that people are kind of surprised that crypto is an issue, right? Um, we, we have so many standards, they're all safe, they're, uh, they haven't been broken, so then the, the up-to-date standard like SHA-3, SHA-2, AES, etc. Uh, but there is still uh, a lot of crypto issues, and that's from some examples, some statistics from Veracode, which they rank crypto issues as the second most uh, uh, occurring issue in, in uh, software applications, is that it's more about uh, the implementation of cryptographic vulnerabilities, the misconfiguration. So uh, when we talk about crypto issues, it's rarely that somebody broke AES. We would be surprised if somebody do, does that. But if somebody doesn't implement AES correctly, 
you get side channels, you can easily uh, get the private key you're using for the computation. So uh, there's a lot of um, issues which are not directly related to the algorithm itself, to the design, to the cryptanalysis, but more to the way how you use it. Uh, and one of the issues is that uh, there's to implement cryptographic algorithms, to use it correctly, you need certain expertise. And there, there's increasing need for this expertise, but there, there are just not enough experts around it so that every company can have their own cryptographic expert and make everything right, right? And uh, have their own testing suite, uh, look for the right, uh, right issues, and so on. So what are the common cryptographic pitfalls? So we have, uh, on one hand, lack of crypto visibility. Uh, that connects to the threat management that we'll talk a little bit about later. But if you're talking about crypto agility, uh, one of the first responses to get that I don't even know what kind of cryptographic algorithms I use, so how should I know if I, uh, I'm vulnerable to certain things? So uh, that's different for, for a security service provider whose business is to know those stuff. But if you're a consumer, if you have a big uh, corporation, a uh, huge system, large network, uh, re rarely people really know or what kind of cryptographic algorithms and what configuration, what parameters uh, they are using. And with that, they don't know if they're actually vulnerable. I already mentioned vulnerable crypto implementation. That's uh, uh, one of the biggest issues, right? You can, uh, by implementing a cryptographic algorithms, a lot of things can wrong. You can do a lot of uh, errors there, which uh, have uh, uh, real-time impact on when you're using those things. And if you're moving on to a new type of cryptographic algorithms, so if you're looking post-quantum cryptography and the various types of post-quantum cryptography, often things getting more complicated and more difficult to implement. And we are also discovering more and more side channels. There's basically every year uh, very, some very mostly fun things people are doing with side channels, but they're really serious issues. New side channels discovered, like, uh, like sound, or like the way the, the uh, screen of your um, laptop uh, display, certain data can be uh, utilized, etc. Then it's about how you actually use, what kind of parameter you use for crypto, how you're using your keys, how you protect your keys, and so on. Then we have uh, huge issues to outdated crypto algorithms. Now, like here we see EGBCA has moved on, Bouncy Castle, they integrating modern algorithms. But there is, besides this BKI scenario, there, the crypto world is huge, and the, or the, the applications and the amount of application using crypto is uh, huge. And there's so many systems out there which use very old algorithms which are weak or are broken. And then we have the quantum computer threat. So you need to know if you're vulnerable to do things. And we will talk a little bit later if you actually need to worry about that or not. Uh, and then, let's say, you have figured out you have an issue, so how you do actually an update on a crypto site. And we just heard in Thomas' presentation the the crypto is touched on so many different places that uh, updating this uh, uh, the system to support or to fix certain issues or maybe even to support new cryptographic algorithms takes a lot of time. And it's a very hard problem. Then briefly mentioned new regulatory requirements. So just listed a bunch of them. Uh, DSS is probably one of the most inter interesting things because they kind of uh, require you to be able to manage your cryptography, to have a sort of inventory, to know what you're using, and you basically have a document describing those things. And there are different uh, regulatory requirements re talking about cryptography on a different levels. But uh, we see there's more and more coming up, and then you have something like sovereign cryptos. You know, we saw it with the Chinese crypto standards, the Russian crypto standards, US standards, Korean standards, and so on and so on. And uh, other countries are, uh, who hadn't standards yet, their own standards, they're probably moving towards them as well. So if you're now an application provider, security service provider, you need suddenly now to comply to do, you sell your products to different countries, you need to comply now to all those different uh, standards. Uh, so the question is how you do that um, efficiently, uh, and that basically brings us to crypto agility then. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, crypto agility, and as Thomas was saying, it's a hot topic. It's getting hotter every year. Uh, four years ago, uh, crypto agility was, was not new. People were inside the small community discussing it, uh, but the industry itself didn't pick it up and saw it as, an, as a necessity. Uh, quantum computers were, uh, the threat of quantum computers were known five, four, uh, four years ago as well, but it wasn't so, uh, seen as an immediate threat. So, uh, 
that has significantly changed. Even Gartner now recommends that you have, if you're basically a billing system, you need to have a, an agile response plan because there's a certain guarantee now that uh, uh, cryptographic algorithms will break and you need to be prepared for that. And they suggest that you have an inventory of your crypto, the, that you build crypto agility into your applications so that you're, uh, when something bad happens, if some issues are discovered, you can react quickly. And when quantum computers are arising, that you're actually prepared and not, not surprised. So what is now cryptography for life cycle management? That brings all things together, basically. The two main components is crypto threat management, which basically is, uh, are the tools to, uh, which let you know that you have an issue uh, and that gives you some, um, some ways to uh, remediate the risk, to reduce the risk. And then is the crypto agility platform, which is basically the tool to uh, solve the issue uh, completely and to make you basically future-proof. So uh, you need a way to have some, some um, to be able to manage the crypto threat you have proactively. You don't wait until issues are popping up and then you fix things. You need to prepare a system so that you can immediately fix them. Uh, you need uh, crypto agility to comply to any future standards. So you, if you build a system and you already know that post quantum crypto standards will be out in the next five to seven years, prepare a system so that you can easily switch now to the new standards without taking a migration time of another seven or eight years. And all that basically ties to the cryptographic expertise, right? So for the threat management, you need to know what to look for and basically classify uh, if something is bad or good. And you need crypto expertise expertise for that. So you need crypto intelligence system which uh, gives you this necessary information to make you, uh, to get, uh, enable you to make a good judgment. And then we have uh, on our side for a crypto agility platform, you need crypto providers like Bouncy Castle which do the cryptographic implementation for you. You don't need to do it yourself. And uh, ideally they provide it in different packages so that you have uh, post quantum crypto providers which you can then plug in when you need it. Uh, you have uh, but the crypto provider will make uh, sure that you get the new standards, uh, et cetera. And all the things, how you basically plug in these crypto providers, for that you need a good crypto agility platform. So crypto agility platform is a, is a, a generic term, but it can be a crypto library like Bouncy Castle or uh, a bigger framework which also takes uh, features like the management of the cryptographic uh, implementations, the, um, the transportation of the cryptographic implementations uh, as well into consideration. So let's take first look at crypto threat management so that you get a little bit of a feeling what, what that means. And basically you need to ask you four questions. So if you now have a big system, you're hopefully using some IT security there, and uh, you need to know now if you're vulnerable uh, to some cryptographic threat. So first you need to know what algorithms are you using actually in the system, where are they used, so what kind of application systems, Hardware are using those cryptographic algorithms. Then you need to know how are they used. So are they used properly? Are you using the right parameters? And are they actually used at all? And you were surprised how often I hear uh, I don't know as the answer for all those four questions. So you need to do something about that. And for that, you basically need tools. And there, are, there are tools out there which, which can uh, help you to do that. So basically, you need some tools which go into a system. Uh, you can, the bigger the system, the less likely is that you can do it manually. So you need some tools which go out there and basically look for cryptographic implementation. They go into your uh, applications and check whether there's a cryptographic algorithm uh, implement, implemented and if it's used and what kind of parameters uh, uh, are used. So you should get a sort of a landscape and, and crypto inventory which tells you uh, this system and this application uses AES, this one uses SHA-1. Uh, then we discovered a couple of self-signed certificates, a couple of certificates which are vulnerable to the Rocca attack, a couple of certificates which are using uh, small RSA keys and so on. So you need tools to look first on the basic crypto library and key size, uh, key um, key site, and then you also need to tools uh, like you know scanning for TLS connections, so looking for servers in your network which have uh, an open uh, TLS SSL port, and check whether what kind of cipher suites are, are um, uh, supported. And if you discover that a very old, weak, and broken cipher suite is supported, then there's probably a misconfiguration. So you need to get first a, a good picture about your environment so that you can act on it. Then, basically, you now have certain information 
Uh, ideally, you did it in a semi or full automated way. Uh, ideally, you do it continuously. And uh, the question is now what you do with this data. So now you need to some intelligence which tells you, are those algorithms safe you discovered? Is so, am I using some weak algorithms? Is the security level sufficient? Is, I'm, am I using two small RSA keys, or are they good? Uh, if I am an organization which needs to comply to different uh, regulatory requirements, I'm complying with those requirements. Are there any known vulnerabilities? I'm using some old OpenSSL libraries somewhere uh, which has uh, known uh, security uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, if quantum computers are in my threat model, are any of my algorithms vulnerable to those things? And there you basically need first sort of a knowledge database and an expert who knows to, what to, know with, uh, to, uh, to do with that. So you sort of need a crypto-focused uh, assessment. You need first to get us inventory, then uh, you need to go through your inventory and check if there are any crypto vulnerabilities, so old outdated algorithms, weak implementation, etc. Uh, somebody you can check uh, for compliance. Uh, confirm that all security profiles you have implemented in your organization uh, are actually fulfilled. And uh, if vulnerabilities are discovered, there need to be some actions uh, in order to, to uh, solve the issues you have. Now, you just need an expert in the database with all kind of information, and ideally, a lot of those things can be automated. So it's not that uh, you need to hire a cryptographic expert. There's, he's sitting there for three months and, uh, and uh, giving it a report. Those things are often also necessary to run continuously. So there are tools out there which help you to do that uh, and uh, do that in a more automated way. So to summary, so crypto inventory and threat management is the first step to crypto agility. You need to know if you have an issue. And then uh, it will basically tell you what and where you need to change certain things. So you need to identify where crypto and how crypto is used. Uh, you need to be able to look up what kind of algorithms uh, are used by which application. You need to be able to detect any vulnerabilities in your code. Do you have some weak implementation? Do you have uh, an, uh, an, an old crypto library used which is known to uh, vulnerable to certain side channel attacks? Uh, am I using Am I storing keys in plain text somewhere? Am I using certificates with bad parameters? Uh, and so on. And then you need to get guidance, somebody who tells you uh, what to do with all this information. And I ideally, you're in able to integrate all those tools in, a, in your infrastructure so that uh, those additional info threat information you get can be integrated in some SIM solutions. You have some constant monitoring and obviously uh, sort of um, high level of automation so that you don't need to do all the things manually. Small systems, if you just have one CA running, one server with one application, and uh, you have uh, uh, four um, devices getting certificates, that's easy to, to look up the things. But if you have a big, bigger network, bigger system, that goes uh, very, very difficult. So now you have information. And now you know that you have an issue. Uh, and you probably take, uh, will, uh, take a lot of time and effort to, to remediate those issues because you probably need to switch out some algorithms. You probably need to prepare a system, have a plan ready when quantum computers are there, how to handle those things, or when suddenly uh, a new attack is discovered for one of the algorithms you're using, how you handle those issues, how can you fix those actions, uh, this, those uh, risks immediately. And there's where crypto agility is important. Now, if you have crypto issues, and it's very likely that almost everyone has some sort of crypto issue, uh, and you need to change something, change it in a proper way. So switching to a new crypto algorithm, like from Shatusha 3, uh, or from uh, an ECDSA to some post-quantum crypto signature scheme, uh, would be the same effort and you completely move to a crypto agile system. So if you need to change something, change it in a way that you uh, don't run into issue in those issues again, so that you can have all this uh, crypto agility, um, crypto agility properties. And uh, as we saw in Thomas' presentation, there is a couple of levels. It took for the soft keys just two hours. Ideally, in my world, I would like to see that each EGBC doesn't need any change at all. There's the Agile EGBC version out there, Crypto Agile version, and you just need an, a module to load up, uh, uh, which implements some new or safer uh, or fixed uh, cryptographic provider, and EGBCA just uses it without any additional code change. That requires a different 
crypto agility platform. Uh, we need to move towards new technology. It's 2018, PKCS 11 might not be the most modern way to talk to HSMs. There are probably better ways, especially if you would like to have crypto, crypto agile ways. But the goal should be that uh, the application, like EGVCA, which is an application of cryptography, does not need to change when something in the crypto stacks uh, has to be changed. So definition, what is this crypto agility? Crypto agility is the ability of a system to easily adopt to alternatives uh, uh, compared to the cryptographic primitives it was originally designed to use. So the keyword here is easily, right? So there are different levels of crypto agility. IRIS is the way that you don't need to change anything or you just need to change parameters. But at some point, you always would need to run some tests, right? Because there often might be some side effects uh, you, don't, you didn't think about it. So why? We need those crypto agility. I already discovered, uh, uh, discussed it a couple of times now. Just to summarize it, you would like to use you know, today's modern cryptography standards. You might have certain needs for different platforms. So you have an application system which should be uh, run on a, on a server, on a smaller device, on a small IoT device, on a microcontroller. Uh, you don't want to reinvent the, the crypto stake every time. Uh, so you might want to have a crypto agile system for your platform with specific needs, you just plug in a crypto provider which provides you with a specific optimized implementation. Then you might require to have a FIP certified crypto provider and uh, you might even have some custom crypto you have to integrate. You would like to be ready for post-quantum uh, and you would like to uh, be able to do infill crypto updates. So don't change system application anymore, just push out the update. So uh, there are many reasons we already discussed why crypto agility is needed. So uh, it's not just uh, if things get broken, there are uh, other reasons besides that. So th the goal is that for an agile crypto architecture, you need to decouple any crypto implementations from the application itself. And uh, GCA uh, is an example for that, right? GCA has an abstract API. Uh, you can plug in providers into it. Uh, and if you're just using the generic GCA API, you can plug in different things and it without changing applications. Um, there are some pros and cons for GCA. Uh, there are other systems out there as well. But the generic idea is, is that you have an abstract API which does the crypto, crypto operations. You don't no longer need to specify what crypto you're using, what specific algorithms, or even what parameters you're using. Everything is basically generic. And the uh, engine or the, the implementation of the uh, crypto edge framework below takes care of that. Uh, and uh, translates whatever is needed. And do you have the core crypto algorithms like encryption, signature, etc. but then you have uh, crypto protocols like TLS, etc., which need to be adopted as well as slightly to be fully crypto agile. And then below you have the actual cryptographic implementation, standard crypto, FIPS, uh, post-quantum, etc. And the goal is that above, you know, on the application side, you no longer need to change anything. That requires certain design principles for the crypto agility uh, library framework, uh, however you would like to name it. So the implementation independence, and some of those are familiar to the GCA design principles. I just, uh, we added a couple of more. Uh, so implementation independence, as I said, application code must be independent from cryptographic implementations. There's no hardcore, uh, hard-coded dependencies anymore. Simplicity, the interface should be easy to use. That's not just for uh, necessary for crypto agile platform, but for every crypto library in general. You need to reduce the risk of uh, coding errors when developers are using your cryptographic library. There must be clear guidelines available. Uh, you don't need to Google for two and hours to figure out how you can actually use uh, a signature algorithm. It should be straightforward. Uh, abstraction, you need a high level of abstraction so that you can, as good as possible, cope with future, uh, future changes. So um, your API should only say just sign stuff. You don't need to care about all the mathematics behind the signature algorithm. You need exchangeability. Cryptographic implementations should be dynamically exchangeable. So you have a running system. It should be just taking a couple of milliseconds to switch out to different signature algorithms. I know there are a couple of implications to do that, but the system should be able to cope with that, or the Crypto Agile Framework should give you the, the tools uh, to make this uh, a possibility. The application as well shouldn't be uh, need to change again. And manageability. So you need tools to be able now to manage those cryptographic uh, implementations. 
Now, by having a system crypto agile, where you can dynamically switch out cryptographic providers, you obviously have also a new attack vector for attackers, right? Because they will obviously try to, to uh, find weakness in that system. And there, your manageability, your management system of this, of, uh, this uh, technique needs to take care of uh, additional security me mechanisms so that uh, s you only uh, load cryptographic providers you trust, so they are signed itself, for example. Etc. You need to think about some uh, secure deployment mechanism for new cryptographic implementations, uh, which is no different to uh, secure software updates, etc. And one of the most important things is portability. Uh, the more platforms you need to support, uh, the higher the requirement that your framework or crypto library runs on every platform you need to support. So it's getting just too more complex if you need to support uh, a system where there's only uh, Java supported and you have now your Java application running yet, but your app same application should run on a uh, smaller device where you only have C compilers and uh, only C applications are able to run there. Uh, instead of having now two different, completely different systems, uh, the agility framework uh, providing you with the crypto agility tools uh, need to support all the words. Uh, so that uh, the complexity on an application developer side is uh, really minimized. And if you implement cryptographic providers and the actual algorithms performance, it's obviously one of, also one of the most important things. Uh, nobody will use a crypto agile framework if your cryptographic implementation in this framework is uh, 10 times slower than uh, some traditional cryptographic library. All right. so. Um, I would like to show you now how those things come together if you look at both quantum cryptography. Um, you already see uh, by the amount of how often post quantum cryptography was mentioned uh, today and yesterday that it's really a serious issue. Um, the major change in, in the way that the topic is discussed in the public is that uh, driven by the fact that the progress in actually building a quantum computer is uh, progressing much faster than expected. Uh, there are various reasons to do that. Uh, I believe most of the reasons are because of all the huge pile of money put into the research because people are not trying to build quantum computers to break crypto. There is a lot of use cases for quantum computers which uh, help uh, in, in uh, very different ways. Uh, uh, to solve very hard problems. But the side effect is that such a quantum computer, the general purpose quantum computer, can, broke, uh, can break uh, our traditional crypto system, public key crypto system. So it's really important, and that's why I bring the topic up again, that you need to know if you uh, are vulnerable to this quantum threat and if you should consider it in your uh, risk assessment. So just to summarize, what gets broken, all the public key system gets broken, we know today. Uh, so the traditional ones, RSA, the Fay-Hellman elliptic curve cryptography uh, gets broken. For symmetric cryptography, it's not as bad. Uh, it basically uh, halves the security level you get. So as we heard yesterday, AES 128-bit keys uh, are as strong as uh, AES uh, as 64-bit uh, keys when we have a quantum computer. Uh, I often hear that people are just saying, that's easy, just double the key size. If you need, still need 256-bit security, there is no AES 512 version, right? So it's, uh, it's not that easy. So if you really require 256-bit uh, quantum security, uh, you need a different block cipher. Question where is you really need 256-bit? I mean, if it already takes, uh, I don't know, 1 billion years to break 128-bit, so if it takes uh, 1 billion times longer, who cares, basically? But there are certain use cases where you need those kind of security levels to also consider that. For hash functions like SHA-2, uh, we have SHA different output sizes already, so the real problem is with public key crypto system. There are alternatives. They are not new. They are not uh, suddenly popped up just uh, last year. Uh, so we have basically five main categories. Uh, just as, a, as an overview, a code-based crypto system are about uh, decoding uh, linear codes. Then we have a uh, hash-based crypto system, which are using hash functions to implement signature schemes. Then we have lattice-based crypto system, which uses uh, problems in, in lattices to define um, uh, key agreement schemes and the signature schemes. Then we have probably uh, it's the newest of the five categories, isogeny-based crypto system. It's uh, based on elliptic curve 
cryptography, so it's something we're already very familiar with and uh, we know how things work. The difference for super uh, singularized origins is that instead of operating on one elliptic curve, you're now operating between different curves. And then you also have multivariate uh, base crypto system, which means, means, means basically you have a nonlinear system of equations and you try to solve it, which is in general a hard problem. I uh, would like to give you in context of this post-quantum crypto uh, an update about the NIST competition. So as we already heard, this competition is going on. Submission deadline for all the proposals was last year in November. And we NIST received, I think, 82 submissions, but only 69 made it to the first round. The, first cat the requirements for the first round were basically sort of formalities. So if you fulfill all formalities, you were allowed to get in the first round. In April, there was the first NIST workshop in Florida, where every uh, group, uh, every candidate was able to have 10 or 15 minutes presentation time, and all the um, authors were presenting their design. We already saw that there are many different designs which are very similar. Uh, so the second round will begin according to NIST the uh, end of this year, or most likely beginning of next year. Uh, we expect that uh, uh, the number of of candidates will be reduced, hopefully significantly, because it makes the analysis easier for those uh, looking at the security of the things. And by 2020, 21, they will probably announce a third round, and afterwards, 2022, 24, probably the, the first drafts for the standards will be available. So what's, just to give you an overview, what, since we know there are five basically categories, how are they distributed along the competition? So the majority is lattice-based, um, then we have code-based uh, followed, and then uh, just a few multivariate. Then we have only s three hash-based plus one symmetric-based, uh, so uh, block cipher-based signature scheme, and there's one isogeny-based scheme, and there are a couple of different other things. But uh, we have now in total 64, because five already got broken and withdraw from the competition. Uh, so 64 remaining. Most of them lattices based. They are quite similar, so a lot of different lattice based. You know, you can make the different trade-offs. There's a lot of different security parameters uh, which you can tweak. That's why you have a lot of different schemes. But NIST uh, urged uh, those um, submissions which look very similar to merge and uh, to reduce it, the number of submission by that. So, do you really need to worry now about quantum computers and? Uh, we already had a couple of quotes from Mikhail Mosca. I use now a different one because it gives you a very simple answer to this question. Uh, basically, you need to think about how long does it take for you to move to a post-quantum crypto algorithm and how long does your data or your system needs to be secure. Uh, and compare that to how long, it until, uh, how long it takes until we have really large-scale general-purpose quantum computer. Uh, I'll give you a simple example. If you're Using a VPN connection, you're transmitting data over this VPN tunnel, which needs to be secure for 10 to 20 years, and people are recording it today. Uh, and in 10 years, we have the quantum computer. Uh, they will be able to decrypt this communication and get, uh, get access to the data. Uh, so if it takes now, let's say, 10 years, if you get a quantum computer, uh, it takes you um, nine years to uh, implement a quantum safe VPN solution, but the data you sent in the nine years minus one day, you're sending still over a standard crypto algorithm needs to be safe for 10 years, then basically screwed because uh, although the next day you're switching over to post-quantum crypto algorithm, the, all the data you sent uh, the day before and which still needs to be secure for 10 years, uh, is no longer secure. So it's uh, some way to think about, I really need to worry about this quantum computers, uh, yes or no. And there's obviously, different types of crypto usage are sort of real-time crypto, like TLS VPN connection, which are easier to change, right? Uh, you don't need to move big uh, chunks of data to a new uh, encryption standard. Uh, if uh, the VPN um, is just using short-lived keys, for example. Uh, but you need to think about the data you're transmitting over those tunnels. So how does all the things come together now? And now you can replace here a quantum computer with any other crypto issue. First you need to know, create a crypto inventory. So you need to know what crypto algorithms you're using in order to uh, make a clear judgment. So if you have now the data, you need to do a risk assessment. Uh, which algorithms are you using? I'm, am I using RSA, elliptic curve? Am I using any public uh, crypto system, which is standard today? Uh, yes, 
uh, how long does my date or signed or uh, the keys using key agreement change and need to be secured. Uh, so you do a risk assessment to identify when I need to worry about when I need to have a fix ready for my system. Uh, now you could do just move to a post-quantum crypto system and then do the change over and over again, but it's much smarter to move to a crypto agile system. So you know you have, will have an issue, but don't wait. Move to a crypto agile system, uh, which might take you some time to migrate to a crypto agile system, but once you've done, the next step to move to a post-quantum crypto algorithm is much, much easier and effortless. So once you have now a crypto agile system, you've done the effort once, now you can decide uh, quantum computers are not there yet, but you're already worried about. M NIST haven't announced the standards yet, uh, but you already need to use a post-quantum crypto algorithm. So use one which experts tell you, uh, tell you are good, which are, could be probably likely to be standardized, but you don't know. And now later NIST uh, has announced the standards and you by accident used an algorithm which is not part of the standards but you need to comply to the standards, so you need to switch again. So this scenario is very likely, right? So there's, we have a lot of different post-quantum crypto algorithms today. If you need to use one today, uh, you have the risk that you will need to move to a different one later. And as we learn more about post-quantum cryptography in general, and as then when we have actual quantum computers to play with, uh, it's very likely that uh, this change from one crypt post-quantum crypto standard to a different one will happen again. So it's... You need to be prepared. You need to have a crypto agile system to cope with those issues. You don't need to do a whole migration for five years every time you need to switch out the algorithms. Then once everything is running and everything is safe again, you need to monitor these crypto sets uh, threats. You need to, to have someone who gives you um, up-to-date threat information, who follows uh, the research community, who knows what kind of vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities are out there, uh, which maps the, those information to your crypto inventory, which is regularly updated and gives you basic sort of real-time information about uh, issues you might have now and uh, you need to fix. To summarize, so cryptography, cryptography lifecycle management is mainly about uh, threat management of crypto issues, crypto agility to make the threat management easy, basically, and as a third uh, uh, factor the cryptographic expertise which uh, you will require for both of the things. All right, thank you very much. I'm open now for questions. Thank you very much, Tomislav. Um, so, we're having a, a bunch of questions uh, being posted uh, on Slido. I don't know if you're going to be able to address them all, but uh, we, we are inviting Tomislav for the round table, so your questions will be addressed. Don't worry about that. But let, let's try with just a couple now before mm -hmm. we continue. Yeah. So uh, there was somebody who asked if the dual signature schemas for the PKI would be a viable way to handle uh, post-quantum for the uh, PKI implementations. I don't know how much it relates the, to your uh, presentation, mm -hmm. I think it relates a little bit to the last year's presentation, yeah, I mean, it's, it's but it's even here. It's, it's basically about crypto agility. I'm assuming uh, the one who asked the question is referring to these hybrid certificates. Uh, we are just seeing where you have uh, a basic a standard certificate with additional uh, X509 okay. extensions, which now incorporates a post-quantum signature. Um, I think it's, it's a good first step uh, to have hybrid certificates. So if you're our near um, threat assessment, this is a consideration uh, before you wait until everybody switched over to fully crypto as your system. It's a, it's a good uh, uh, intermediate solution. But I believe uh, the type, the way of how we issue certificates and how certificates itself look like needs to modif be modified as well and move towards mm -hmm. more crypto agile data formats, etc. Uh, and then there was somebody who said, do you have a, an estimate on uh, how much slower agile crypto would be? You mentioned a little bit about it, uh, mm -hmm. that you uh, would like it not to be slower, but I guess uh, they, they say like as compared to hard-coded uh, algorithms. Uh. So uh, there's two things you need to consider, hardware crypto and software crypto. For software crypto, the, uh, cr the overhead crypto agility uh, introduces is not really a performance issue. So the, okay. the performance comes from the actual implementation and you can do a fast implementation just the way how you use it. Hardware crypto is a different story because hardware crypto is hard-coded crypto and hardware. 
Uh, and if you need, for example, an, an ECC accelerator, which accelerates your ECDSA signature scheme, uh, switching out the hardware cannot be done in an agile way. What in my opinion needs to be done, that needs to be done by the hardware industry is uh, to move towards accelerators which are more generic. You will never have a hardware accelerator which works for all kinds of different public key crypto system, <laughs> but you can generalize certain mathematical uh, components which will speed up a, a bigger vari variety of cryptographic system. So, ladies and gentlemen, just in the interest of time, we will stop now, but all of your questions will be addressed at, at the round table. Uh, both for the Tomislav and Sini, there were a bunch of questions. For Ryan, there were a bunch of questions. So in the afternoon, we will continue. There were, uh, I see your interest is quite, quite keen on this. So, uh, Thanks, All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.